Welcome back everyone. Today we're talking about semantic analysis. So, so far, we've only been talking about lexing and parsing. So at this stage here, we have a nice abstract syntax tree that follows the syntax of our language. So we have a bunch of classes, statements, expressions that are all properly nested. Now we need to perform various additional checks. Even though the program is syntactically correct, it might not be correct with regards to other aspects. So what do we check in semantic analysis? Well, we check everything that we can check statically, statically meaning without running the program. And it has to run in a reasonable amount of time. So a good example of something that's very interesting, but that you cannot do because it takes too long is symbolic execution. Symbolic execution is when you try to execute the program, but instead of supplying it real inputs, you supply it symbolic inputs, so variables. So imagine you have a function that takes an integer. Instead of giving it an integer like two or three, you pass it a variable called x. And if the function returns x multiplied by two, then you return a symbolic variable that knows that its value is equal to x multiplied by two. As long as you simple things like that, it works well. The problem is that at some point the execution will fork because of if statements. Say you have if x is greater than 10, well, you do not know the value of x. And because of that, you will need to assume two paths, one where x is bigger than 10 and one where x is smaller than 10. And if after that you have another if statement, suddenly you don't have two paths, you have four paths, etc., etc., And so you end up with an exponential amount of paths to the program, which is not manageable. This is called a combinatorial explosion. So this is to give you an example of thing that we can check statically, and it's very interesting to do in other contexts, but there's no place in a compiler because it's too slow. So everything you check, of course, is something that you didn't check in the parser. I have an advice for you, and it's check as little as possible in the parser. The role of the parsing stage is not to validate the program as well as possible. It is to make nice trees, trees that have the shape that you want. Why do I give this advice? because parsing errors are not that good. And if you validate later using code that you wrote yourself and not just a grammar formalism, you will be able to generate your own errors, which will be more descriptive. And you'll be able to do checks that are more involved also. So let me give you an example. Here is something that you can check in a grammar, but that you shouldn't because it's horrible. And that's the modifiers in Java. So in Java, if you have a method, in a class, it can have all of these modifiers, public, private, predicted, final, static, synchronized. There are, however, constraints. A method can only have one visibility modifier, right? It can only be public or private or protected. It cannot be public, private. It can also not be public, public. Similarly, for all these others, they cannot be repeated. So you cannot be static, static. So you can encode this in a grammar and, and let me show how. So you say, class method mods, which is a list of class method modifiers. So it could be a visibility modifier followed by another rules, which is a repetition of modifiers, accepted visibility modifiers. And you have the same principle here. So final followed by another list of modifiers, which does not include final or static or synchronized. But then you need to actually define those. And so let me define non-visibility class method mods and it's the same as here. So it's all the options are not visibility modifiers, except that now I need another rule that says class method modifiers that are non-visibility and non-final or non-visibility and non-static. And so you need to encode every single possible combination in the grammar. That is huge. Like it will take you hundreds of lines of code to do that. This only works for non-abstract classes. So interfaces have other constraints, abstract classes have other, other constraints. It does not even really work for uh, normal classes because, for instance, it does not prevent protected static, which is invalid in Java. So here is something that you should validate in semantic analysis and not in the parser. You could also write a, a custom parsing combinator in Atom that would work. So you write custom code that does some parsing. Honestly, don't do that. Just defer it to semantic analysis if you can. I said that errors are better in semantic analysis. So here's an example, public, private. Of course, that's wrong. Probably if you use a parser, you'll get an error that looks sort of like this, unexpected token private here. 
if you code your own semantic analysis, on the other hand, then you can generate a better error, just like two visibility modifier for method. And then you can also add the name of the method. You can also say that the, the modifiers are public and private in this case, etc. That's much more precise. Another reason that you want to be lax in the parser, you want to allow many things, is that even incorrect ASTs, they are very valuable. And a, do, a good example of that is when you are using an IDE. So in the IDE, if you write this, it doesn't really matter. It should still be able to resolve the test method. It should still give you syntax highlighting. It should still let you jump to definition, etc. But if this doesn't parse at all, then this is very difficult to do. It needs a parse tree to be able to implement all these features. And so it's better to have incorrect parse tree. And, and if the ID sees that, it can just decide, OK, whatever, I'll just assume that it's public and ignore this. IDs like IntelliJ, they actually have very specific parsers that are designed to be very, very permissive. They also allow a much worse mistake than just this. Like they will allow mismatched blocks and things like that. And they will also try to use the previous version of the code to fix the current AST. That is beyond the scope of this class, but it is also very interesting. I said you should check everything you can. What do we in practice usually check? Well, the big one is type checking. Type checking is two things. It's checking type constraints. So if I write int x equals string, I have a constraint here, which says that x has to be a, an integer. And I have a type here, which I need to determine. So this is a string. And then I need to check that there is an adequation between the constraint and the actual type. So in this case, it's a type error. There is type inference. And type inference is almost the same. So in, in Java 11 and then afterwards, you can write var. And this means that the type of the variable x will be inferred from the type of the right hand side. So first I need to determine the type of this expression. So this is a string plus an integer is going to be a string. And so now I know that that type string is, is going to be the type of the variable x. A word about dynamically typed language. You might think, well, if I do a dynamically typed language, I will avoid all this work. There is some truth to that, but you will need to check types eventually. You will need to do it in the runtime. So for language features, for instance, if you are going to try to index an array, you will need to check that the index is actually an integer. And if you write standard libraries for a language, you will need to check in the libraries. You want to know a way to make a really shitty language is don't check anything. So in your project, you're going to implement your language, you're going to write an interpreter. If you don't check types, you can do it. And what will happen is that your program will crash with a null pointer exception or with a class cast exception. It will give a Java stack trace that is completely useless for the user of the language. So don't do that. Always check types. So the other big concern of semantic analysis is name binding. Name binding basically means you want to find where a name was defined. So if I have this code, int x equals y plus 3, I want to know where y was defined. Fairly easy. There is an interdependency with typing. So even in this example, to verify that this is indeed an integer, and to know what y is. It gets even more involved when you deal with structures or classes. So to know the type of this, I need to know the type of C, which depends on the type of B, which depends on the type of A. So it's impossible to conceive type checking and name banning separately. They are completely in intercorrelated. Another aspect of semantic analysis, and one that is not often discussed, is flow checking. So this is an invalid Java program. Why? Because it should return an integer, but it only returns in the if, when x is 3. If x is not 3, the function doesn't return anything. So this is invalid. Java is actually very cute in that it, it does some advanced checking here. So this is a valid Java program because it determines that the while loop is always entered. And so this function will always return. So it's extra smart. In general, you can't assume that the body of a while loop will be executed because you can't evaluate the condition. But here it's a constant, so it says, oh, of course, this is always true. And so I will allow this. Finally, you can do much more stuff. Here is a code fragment for a language called Wiley. And the big thing of Wiley is that it does statical analysis of invariants, precondition, postcondition, etc. So in this case, you have uh, the function apps for absolute takes an integer, returns an integer, and it guarantees that the implementation of the function 
returns an integer that is positive or zero, it also ensures that the return value is either x or minus x. So these are the post conditions. And it is able to statically check that. So you can do quite a lot of fancy stuff. There's also another language called Daphne, which does more or less the same thing. Another fashionable language these days is Rust. What Rust does is that statically, it controls the lifetime of memory allocations. This allows it to be safe, so it does not have memory leaks, it does not have memory use after release problems, and all of that without using a garbage collector like Java does. So I want to give you a bit more details on name binding, and particularly the kinds of scoping that we use. So lexical scoping is scoping that follows the structure of the file, of the text, and particularly of the nesting of the blocks. You have a class here. This class has two fields and one method. When you're at the start of the class, what's in scope? Well, the method. Even though it's defined after, the method is visible in the whole class body. So if I wanted to define field one in terms of method, I could just put a call to method here. That would be legal. Then we define file one, and now file one is also in the scope. Inside the method, uh, you can see I've, I've put some blocks, I've put some definitions. So let me give you an example. In scope in this block, there's method, because it's visible everywhere in the class, field one, because it's defined in the class, field two, even though it's defined after, inside a method that is visible, that's something else that you need to think about, right? Like here, field two is not visible. Like if I want to define field uh, 1.5, I can't use field two because field two is after, but in the method, field two is visible. Of course, the parameter of the method is visible. A is visible because it's defined at the top level of the method. And C is visible because it's in the current block. B is not visible because it's in a block that is now closed. And D is not visible because it's defined after. And of course, at the end of the method, then C is no longer visible. And D is now visible. So this should not be too surprising. But know that this is called lexical scoping. And lexical scoping is in contradiction with another thing, which is called dynamic scoping. So this is an example of Emacs Lisp. And let me go through the example. So we define a variable whose value is minus 99. We define a function that returns the value of the variable. And notice that x here is not a parameter of the variable. So I say it's, it's used free. But it, it does refer to that, in fact. Now we're going to write this. So this, what this does, it says, let's assign x to 1 temporarily, and then call get x. And because x has been assigned to 1, get x will return 1. But after we exit this block, we call get x again, and now it returns minus 99. So you should understand this is very different from the lexical model. In fact, it is not possible to do this in Java. Well, it is possible to simulate it, but there's no notion of dynamic scoping where you just use such a function and now we just know that it was temporarily assigned. Why is this interesting? In the example of this language, Emacs Lisp, this is the configuration language for the Emacs editor. And in this context, you might want to change how some code works depending on the context. So to give you an example, if I'm editing a Ruby file, and at the same time, also editing a Python file. In the Ruby file, if I reformat my code, I might want the tab size to be two characters, two spaces. And the Python file, I might want that to be four spaces. And so I will define a variable, and I will use a let to, when I'm working in Python, use four spaces. When I'm working in Ruby, use two spaces. And then run the code, and the code will look up the variable and it will use the proper value depending on the context. This idea was popular in the past. Now it's making a bit of a resurgence. So for instance, if you know Scala, one of the big uses of implicits in Scala is to implement something like dynamic scoping. This was a short video to just introduce the concept of semantic analysis and everything you can do with it. The most common thing we will do in semantic analysis is type checking, name binding, and flow checking. We can also do much more, such as checking for invariance, post conditions, and also checking for memory safety. 
uh, my advice when you write your language, defer as many checks as possible to semantic analysis. Don't check too much in the parser because that makes for bad errors and it will pollute your grammar. That's it for this video. Next time we'll talk about formal type system and we'll see and as an example the most popular formal type system, the Hidley Milner type system, which is actually used as the basis for type checking in Haskell and ML. Until next time, take care.